Hello, my name is Gavin Hopkins and I'm part of a, a small but perfectly formed team with a support cast of hundreds that put together our time, our efforts on our energy to build an absolutely amazing cycle park for children in our local community. What I'd like to do is to share that journey with you and hopefully give you not only some top tips and guidance, but hopefully inspire you and motivate you to do something similar within your local community. We are part of a cycling group called Far Cycles, and we have been cycling collectively for about nearly 12 years now, initially with a small group of people. That's grown year on year. We now have around about 150 members, and we're really into sort of inclusive cycling, encouraging as many people to be active as possible, reaching out to all spectrums of cycling abilities from some what we call the, the lycra clad speedy boys to those people that really just want to enjoy the social aspects of cycling short distances and having a cup of coffee at a local cafe. So that, that really has grown and done fantastically well. One of the things that we do on an annual basis is to have a sportive and that's been brilliant in terms of showcasing our local countryside, but also it's been very positive in terms of generating um, an income stream for the various activities that we fund and support that are cycling related. And on that, initially, whilst we were a group of keen cyclists, uh, we've really reflected on our values and objectives and felt it's so important that we should use our, our talents and our energy to try and not only uh, persuade and influence and work with policy makers on cycling infrastructure, but actually roll up our sleeves and get involved in delivering things where there would be a direct benefit for our community. So the cycle park, um, it was nine months in the planning and the execution and arm wrestling with the lease agreements and going through planning hoops, uh, three months in the construction. And at the end of it, we've created something that really is um, quite amazing. We think we have in excess of 50,000 visitors to the cycle park each year a uh, mixture of uh, parents and children and the average duration that people stay at the cycle park is for around about an hour and what is quite fascinating is that people are prepared to travel 30 40 miles to come to our local community cycle park as the as the word has spread and we've got some really good positive feedback so hopefully as i said earlier this presentation uh, will help to maybe inspire you, maybe motivate you, maybe gives you an opportunity to share some of our uh, highs and lows or our experience. And hopefully as a takeaway for you, it's for you to reflect and decide if you think something similar would certainly benefit your local community. What I'd like to do is to take you through uh, briefly through a seven point plan and probably one of the things I should say, let's treat this as very much a high level presentation. There may be requirements for more detail or information or one to one discussions or fact sheets, but let's deal with those towards the end of this discussion. So fundamentally, what I'd like to do is to talk about establishing the need for a similar project within your local community talk about the key skills and competencies of the project team, some of the experience we, we went through in terms of fundraising, how we went about the, from the concept to the design, to the engagement, going through planning, up until the project management aspects, prior to the construction phase, and then once it was built, what did we do about promoting it, marketing it? How have we evolved our model, model based on feedback and based on uh, funding opportunities? and the needs of our local community. So let's talk initially about establishing the need. One of the things I would do is to say it's really important that you do your homework and um, the, the, the scheme that you are developing, there is a genuine desire for it. So one of the things we did um, quite successfully, we did a, a local open survey to the whole of our community. Uh, we were fortunate in getting uh, over 200 really positive responses and out of that group of in excess of 200, 96% of all respondents said, what a fantastic idea, brilliant, bring it on, I can't wait till you have it. 55% uh, also said they would use the cycle park regularly and it would be fantastic for their children and their grandchildren. And it was quite interesting out of that survey that 26% of the respondents said there was a fundamental fear of cycling on 
roads and some form of safe cycling environment to develop cycling skills would be a really positive thing for them to embrace. So do your homework. We had a, a real positive tidal wave of tidal wave of let's do this. What I would say, I think going back when we did our original schematics and thinking about what it might look like, that plan didn't really need to change very much. And having delivered it and a year into the usage phase, I still think we did a pretty good job in the early days. But have, have a look at, see if there are any other schemes. Think what works for them and um, let's, let's kind of learn from that. For example, we identified uh, a small number of similar projects around the UK where the local council had turned up and painted some white lines on a disused tennis court. And I think that's a long way from seeking an environment where people can thrive and has a, has a real sense of kind of ownership. So that was one of the key learning points from us. I think it's also really important that you talk to town councils, local authorities, county councils, uh, and just understand what sort of um, uh, support mechanisms and what, and what sort of uh, similar projects might be running in your area. Little point reinventing the wheel, little point developing a scheme if something's going to happen five miles down the road. So doing your due diligence or your homework is really important. Now, you don't need me to talk through this, but let's be clear about with these sort of projects, let's not just sell the features, let's think about the benefits. And here we go for the record, but clearly cycling has such a significant health benefit, it is beyond belief. It's far kinder to the joints uh, in terms of uh, running and contact sports. And it's something that you can take into later life. I can go on for hours, but I won't. One of the things that's really come home is the importance of the social aspects of our cycling group. And we have created new friendship groups who have gone on to enjoy each other's company outside cycling forums. Uh, we have been on cycling trips around Europe and you know, bring it on, the more the merrier. And we've seen people really grow in stature and confidence uh, and people that may be in a, an element of isolation, having a real sort of bond with other people in the community. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Mental health and wellbeing, uh, clearly uh, we're in an environment uh, and a stage at the moment with the, uh, the pandemic, going through quite a high number of emotional highs and lows. And at the end of the day, cycling, um, it's very positive in terms of giving you coping mechanisms and, and giving you a personal resilience to some of those challenges that crop up from time to time in life. Let's promote cycling as a positive change of lifestyle. You know, let's think about what is the opportunity, not always to jump in the car and do the two, uh, you know, the two minute trip to Tesco's, but could that journey be realistically done on a bicycle, providing there's a safe cycling network from you to, to, from you to get to point A to point B. And clearly one of the things that we're really keen on is just maybe looking at models from other parts of Europe where cycling is a fundamental way of life for many of those communities. And the more we can embrace that, the better. And also we felt that Cycle Park was a brilliant way in terms of that 26% that were nervous about cycling on public highways. If people could learn to cycle in a safe environment and we give people the, the confidence to own their space on the roads and do the right things for the right reasons through coaching, through mentoring, uh, through sharing our experiences, those sort of things have been really important. In terms of get, engaging with the community, Again, um, let's always be passionate and positive and let's have that can-do attitude. You will come up against barriers, you will come up against negative people, but let's kind of <laughs> st stick to the vision and make this thing happen. In terms of understanding both who the user group are and other stakeholders you might need to influence within the local community, you may well be uh, borrowing land that's owned by the town council or the local authority so they're clearly important but let's just sort of maybe mind map or be very clear about who, who those people or community groups are that you need to um, touch in the process and again we went to visit the three principal schools in our town and one of the things I always remember this it's a, amazing really as a young lad I used to cycle to school and 30% of my mates did uh, we have a local school, community college, 1,200 people go to that. And out of those 1,200 people, would you believe it, 
only three of those people regularly cycle to school. And again, why, why is that the case? Well, it's, I was gonna say paranoid parents, but that's, that's an unfair statement, but certainly parents that are very concerned about the risks associated with cycling on the roads, particularly at a busy commuter time. And also, would you believe, from the child's point of view or the youth's point of view, there's an understanding that maybe cycle helmets don't look too cool and it's something that mum and dad's insisting on. So those, I think, are areas that we can work on and they're barriers that we can break down. And I think that sea change is slowly happening, really, isn't it? Um, yeah, the other thing we, we, we thought was, you know, um, a chap in his 50s, traditional methods of communication, we fundamentally underestimated the power of uh, social media in terms of getting high impact messages and communicating to broader groups of people. Um, you know, so if you want to get a message out quickly, uh, a positive message, and you want to get some quick responses, you want to pull together people on a, on a cycling event, uh, do it through Facebook. It works every time. And it is the, you know, the, the tool of communication uh, for the masses. So let's go with the flow and let's uh, work with those things uh, that work really well. As I've touched on earlier, you will come across a small group of people that are not in my backyard, quite negative about these things. But let's, again, stick to that vision. Let's make this thing happen. And we know when we've delivered something, we're doing all the right things for all the right reasons. Just one point that I wanted to touch on briefly, and that's a little bit about your delivery model or your organisation. One of the things that we identified fairly early on, it was quite important that Far Cycles Limited got charitable status. A couple of benefits around that. It's a clear message about uh, strong, robust leadership and governments. It dictates how we run our activities. We found fairly early on that uh, uh, grants and other people that make contributions like to be associated with uh, giving to charities. There is also, we understand, uh, a tax benefit from uh, companies, uh, commercial, local commercial companies uh, donating to companies that have a charitable status. So that's zero cost, quite an important thing to do. Uh, thoroughly recommend that. Um, what we also decided was really important in terms of founding our organisation, we've set ourselves up as a limited company, limited liability company. That has the possibly the downsides of having to submit annual accounts to companies house. The real big benefit for us is the extent of the liability is probably the assets within the organization. So we're not into a situation where there's been an incident and we could face uh, uh, crippling uh, costs, which might not be covered by an insured. So I couldn't think for one minute how or why that would happen, but certainly limited, lim limited liability company is the way to go. I would strongly rec recommend you talk to your accountant or your financial coach or advisor uh, whether that registration is the right thing to do for your project. Clearly there's a benefit there that you can recoup the VAT elements of expenditure. You probably need to dig into a little bit more detail about VAT implications of, of donations and, and other funding streams. So again, that's I think an important thing to look at. In terms of Pulling together the project team, um, we were fortunate that we had the services of a quantity surveyor. We had a guy that was um, pretty good at uh, putting uh, some fairly um, inspirational designs down on paper. We lent on a, a cycling friend who uh, ran a planning business. Um, I've got some engineering um, project management skills, which, which came in really useful. And Far Cycles as an organization, you know, we have a um, semi retired accountant that's uh, supported us and pointed us in the right direction when we when we uh, needed to. Uh, we felt it was appropriate that we use a commercial property lawyer in terms of getting some independent impartial advice so that we can negotiate the best lease terms with the local authority that owns the land. So that was an important cost for us. But what I would say is throw the net wide. Most people will be delighted to give their time and effort and resource to community-based spirits uh, projects. Sorry, but if that's not always uh, achievable, then occasionally you might need to sort of pull in some uh, expert advice and pay an appropriate market rate for that. In terms of funding, uh, well, we we did, we were incredibly fortunate. The overall cost of our scheme, with some 
minor variations, which I'll talk about later, was uh, just shy of £80,000 as a, as a gross amount. And around about 50% of that um, contribution came from uh, a grant called the, the European Leadership Grant, was, which is aimed at uh, helping local rural communities invest in uh, projects that will increase tourism or footfall or make their businesses more secure. And we made a fairly robust case to, to get some funding and that's been absolutely brilliant. What I would say is the more stones you turn over in looking for uh, um, sums of money that are available. And so talk to your local authorities, talk to your town councils, talk to other sports clubs and associations and whether it's kind of national lottery or contributions from local developers. Uh, there really is some pretty big pots of money out there. What I would say, and um, we felt this was really important, we couldn't just sit back and rely on those external parties to, in the words of Bob Geldof, give us your cash. What we actually did, we were very um, pragmatic and very, very disciplined. We had a number of fundraising uh, community-based events, uh, a long music weekend generated in excess of um, 5,000 pounds. We've recently been incredibly successful in setting up a pop-up cycling shop in our local community. And again, that's generated several thousand pounds in terms of funding for other, script, other schemes. So do the community stuff. It might not necessarily create huge sums, but it is really important to people that are making investments in your organization that you are playing your part and, uh, and you see the importance of uh, generating cash yourself. It is quite important. I think if you are developing a scheme, get some pretty good indications of likely project costs. And I think you need to be in a pretty secure financial position before you kick the project off. One of the things that we were very mindful of is the bulk of our cost was the principal contractors uh, construction phase costs. Um, they wanted a sum of money up front for the procurement of some of the uh, materials. Uh, we over a three month period, we did three measures of work completed and we had to pay them pretty quickly in terms of uh, that, 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 uh, that, that work. So we actually were in a, a fortunate circumstance that a couple of our directors made a, a short cash term loan for our project. Um, not ideal. We thought it was a low risk um, thing to do, but just do think about that. And in terms of some of the grants, um, some of those payments are only released up to 60, 90 days after the project has been completed. So there could potentially be a cash in, a, a, a lag in terms of cash flow, but do your homework, look at the risks, um, and it's really down to you to make uh, some personal decisions based on the individual circumstances. Now, uh, you can see in the screen here, this is a very uh, simplified view of um, the, the concept that we came up with. Um, one of the things we felt was uh, really important is that the design replicated local features uh, in Farringdon. So we have All Saints Church, we have the Town Hall, uh, we have the Folly Hill, and those were uh, miniature models that were placed on the site to give it a sense of uh, local community ownership. And it's fantastic to see the, the really young children climbing up the little mound to uh, uh, so that dad can take a photograph next to the, the miniature sized uh, folly tower and it really does sort of uh, bring the whole thing together so as part of the design i think it's quite important that you think about um, having roundabouts having t-junctions um, having crossroads um, and having pedestrian crossings which are the sort of um, uh, features that you will come across on the, on, on the highway so that was really important in terms of the design, uh, we had a cost saving benefit because we, the extracted material that we excavated to form the, uh, uh, the road, we managed to reprofile that on the site. So there was no uh, large costs associated with uh, um, muck away. Um, we designed the scheme uh, with materials that have long shelf lives. Um, we thought it was critically important that we had a positive impact on the environment. So we've planted several hundred trees in the area and that was um, uh, done again uh, through a working party and uh, those, uh, you know, sponsor a tree. So there's all sorts of things that you could think about there. I guess the other thing is uh, looking at a tarmac road surface, it probably has a design life of 
probably up to 25, maybe 30 years. And one of the things that we thought was really important is we introduced a, um, a soft play area, it's called Mugger, so, Muga, so that when young children, if they take a tumble off a, a balanceability bike, it's, it's a soft landing and it, and it doesn't put them off cycling. That actually has a design life of, we believe, about 10 years. So it is quite important that we make a, a financial provision for the maintenance and upkeep of those things. But think about sustainability in your design. Think about the positive impacts on the environment. And I guess with those two aspects, you're probably not going to go too far wrong with your planning application and uh, planning, planning requirements. So just in terms of managing the project, um, the, you know, I mean, our landowner was the Vale of the White Horse District Council. Um, the scheme was a particularly good fit. It was located on a, a sports field complex. So we think we've got a secure foundation that wouldn't be uh, uh, potentially looked at by a, by a developer. Um, we've had some uh, quite protracted and interesting discussions with the Vale of the White Horse to get them around to our way of thinking, but that has been a success at the end of the day. The planning process was in incredibly drawn out and we got some really good advice and uh, we responded positively to all the uh, planning, uh, uh, planning conditions. So again, that was really good. Our lease agreement, um, that's, uh, that has been extended in terms of uh, finalizing that but the initial lease is over a 25 year term we pay a peppercorn rent uh, if it is required and uh, what we're fairly i mean a lot of that lease is is around a, a positive and consistent and ongoing usage of that as a, a facility so that's really down to us to make it happen think about insurances as part of the lease agreement we were required to take out a 10 million pound uh, public liability insurance provision, which has a premium of just over a thousand pounds a year. Uh, possibly through negotiation, you could get a cost saving by maybe reducing that down to uh, five million pounds. In terms of early discussions with the landowner or the local authority, one of the things to try and achieve, and this would be fantastic if it did happen, is to get the local authority to, to physically adopt the scheme. So what that actually means going forward is they take responsibility for the upkeep, for the repair and the maintenance and uh, things like mowing, mowing the grass in the area and uh, you know, deep weeding and things like that. We weren't able to achieve that. Uh, we have created our organisation, so we have a, an ongoing provision for that. Um, and that provision is around about £2,000 a year. And we've been very good at sort of pulling together um, local community working parties uh, just to keep on top of things as we, as we need to with the young saplings that have been planted uh we the early early weather in the year meant we had to do an awful lot of uh, watering to keep those alive and the just the response and the input from the community has been absolutely fantastic but think about adoption uh, think about maintenance and repair and make sure you have an appropriate uh, financial provision to cover you for that so um, one of the things that's quite important is to clearly get the construction phase absolutely right. Um, the landowner might dictate the number of people that you need to go out to tender to. Um, we were uh, driven in terms of the specification, in terms of the depth of the base course, the compaction, uh, the finishing services by the Vale of the White Horse District Council perfectly fine and in an industry accepted specification. We did think it was quite important that we had a contract to protect as if there was going to be a contractual dispute. So we chose the uh, joint conditions of contract for minor works uh, and that should hold you in pretty good stead. So if there is a fallout with the contractor, there's a, there's a legal cause of redress to uh, settle any financial or performance related disputes. <clears throat> in terms of going out to tender, we did ask a local quantity surveyor to pull together a bill of quantities so that each tender had exactly the same information. I think one of the other things is uh, once we got the prices, we actually did um, choose the company that was most cost efficient. But I think as part of that, and this is really important from my personal experience, you need to choose a contractor that's a really good fit for your business or, or, or your group and your values the last thing you want to do is to get involved in arguing about variation orders or additional unplanned costs from day one so we you know we had some highs and we had some lows 
um, but the project came in on budget. Um, we did, and this is re again really important, have a schedule of rates for variation orders up front, so that's all nailed and agreed. We changed the specification very slightly, um, and these were for all the right reasons. One is we thought it would be appropriate to, or important to put a weed-proof membrane underneath the, uh, the base course material, which would minimize the, uh, the ongoing maintenance cost. We've talked about the, uh, the mugger, the soft area, and we also changed um, a couple of the layouts marginally. So I think that all worked pretty, pretty well. Really delighted that the contractor took his health and safety seriously, produced Harris fencing around the outside. So we had a you know, clearly defined safe area of work. From my point of view, I was the um, project manager for the works and that really was ultimately getting involved in the kickoff meeting and just paying some fairly regular visits and encourage, you know, people, people like Cornish pasties and thanking people, working with them. And if you are discussions to be had about price variations, it makes those discussions a lot better. So it went really well. And uh, I was adamant that we were going to leave this project shaking hands with the principal contractor and appreciating what a fantastic job they've done for us. So I've talked a little bit about uh, interim payments. Um, in terms of health and safety, it really is down to the principal contractor to do his own uh, risk assessment and um, have his own methodology for, um, for vetting any subcontractors that he may appoint. Also, under construction design and management regulations, the principal contractor is required to put together a construction phase health and safety plan, something that I have some experience in, but again, if people want any guidance or support on that, I'm more than happy to talk it through. So I identified myself as the project manager. We did, we chose not to hold back a retention fund in the end, at the end of the day, because we felt the quality of the, the build was, was really good. You could potentially hold back five or 10%, which could be agreed up front. And that might be released three months after um, final completion, or it might be released uh, subject to the landowner being happy with the final completion, or it might be released subject to a small series of snagging items or minor, minor repairs being completed. So that's really for you to think about. I've talked about this earlier, but we did some uh, fantastic work. You can't probably see it in these images here. We really do some fantastic work in terms of landscaping in a sustainable uh, way. So yeah, let's just not build the thing out of tarmac and move on but let's sort of make sure it's umbilically linked with the stunning local countryside. Nearly there, in terms of usage, um, well, I guess it's about, um, um, you know, teaching people to young children of different abilities to cycle confidently. And clearly that's about reaching out to parent groups. It's about reaching out to schools. Um, it's about putting things on social media that are a direct hook or a direct interest um, to, to the people that are learning to uh, cycle. So just really think about the size of your market, whether you actually promote the cycle parks in adjacent towns and villages. Um, and again on that, one of the things that we were quite fortunate with the regular number of people that drive in, the sports ground has, has parking to more than accommodate those. Um, so it has been a really good fit. In terms of skilling up the team, we have round about 25 of our friends and colleagues that are trained up to uh, run formal training courses. Um, and again, one of the things that we've done pretty successfully, and this does get reviewed and it does get updated, we have an annual training plan. And if we have an event um, coming up, that'll be shared in social media. And inevitably, the uptake on that has been absolutely uh, Fantastic. The grand opening was well planned, well executed. We had hundreds and hundreds of people there. We bought a huge, great uh, metal bike to be a, a feature for the grand opening. And I, you know, I was almost in tears, just sort of uh, taking a step back and realizing what we've achieved. And probably more than anything, seeing the smile on the children's faces and just how much of a a fun and practical time and experience it is. We've also been really fortunate, you can see in the picture here that the cycle park is, uh, with it being within a sports ground, there is a, a one kilometer uh, circular 
uh, track. So slightly older children can maybe loop around that, whilst younger children uh, can learn to cycle. So it does sort of reach out and uh, have benefits for the whole family. And just to the uh, the east of the site, there is a, a skateboard park as well. So perfect. Um, if numbers are low of users in the first uh, few weeks, days, months, don't worry about it. If, you, if you're getting this thing right, you're engaging with the community, uh, numbers will grow. Um, I think it's also just important to say that as an organisation, and this is touching on some sort of corporate governance stuff, we've been really um, keen that we make sure we have appropriate insurances where we loan out bikes, we check them, we maintain them. We always do a visual inspection of the cycle park to make sure there's no feces or broken glass or anything like that. All this is documented, it's all fully covered and we've shared what we do with our insurance provider. So we really do think we're running what I would call a best in class operation. So, and as part of that, clearly, uh, we cover all obligations associated with um, safeguarding. So we have a, a safeguarding officer and we keep abreast with uh, industry guidance on, on how to work with uh, minors. Probably also worth saying, we've managed to keep the cycle park open through um, through the COVID pandemic, and that's about recognizing and embracing social distancing. Um, and um, it's also about making sure that uh, family groups can take turns to share the park. And again, feedback on that has been really positive. People just want to get out of their houses and exercise, and uh, we couldn't have done that better. Right, we're nearly there. Let me show you a short uh, video clip, if this works, to pull it all together. And I've just got a few closing comments to finish. We're here at the Folly Sports Ground in Farringdon. Uh, it's a very exciting morning because we're doing the layout. Uh, the chaps just behind me are starting to lay the bark out uh, for the new cycle training path. Raising money for uh, quite a long time. We've had a number of grants, some large, some small, and they've all culminated as a, in us getting uh, permission to build uh, a cycle path that will be used by children, uh, by adults, uh, for getting to improve their cycle skills. There'll be a path around here. Uh, a tarmac layout for cycling uh, and also a rubberized area, MUCA, multi use uh, games area uh, for beginners so they won't have fear of falling.
Okay, I told you my IT skills weren't brilliant, but we got there in the end. Okay, so thank you very much for, for listening to this. I hopefully it's given you some useful thoughts or considerations. Um, and, you know, um, please, 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 the more of these schemes that we can have around the UK, the better. If you do want to get in touch, please contact us through our uh, websites, farcicles.org.uk. Please open welcome, open uh, invitation to visit our cycle park at any time. I hope this has gone some small way in terms of inspiring you and motivating you. We've had a fantastic journey in terms of building this thing. Dare I say it, we've enjoyed every minute and we, we sit back and kick ourselves about some of the great things that we've achieved. So get, in, get on board, do it, make it happen. Thank you very much. And let's hope I can turn this off.